Within a short period of time, it seemed as if hell had broken loose and buildings began to actually implode. It was tremendous heat. He was being showered with huge embers falling on him. He was seeing all the conditions he had warned against. Damro was a firefighter's firefighter. He knew what he believed in and he didn't back down. Decades after the Civil War were a kinetic age, an age of energy and movement, new frictions and rampant growth. Millions of immigrants melted into the countless factories of America's Industrial Revolution. But the rapid, often haphazard, construction of dense cities accelerated the scourge of the 19th century. Large urban fires. From San Francisco to New York. From New Orleans to Milwaukee. America's cities were burning. And yet, Nothing prepared the nation for what happened in Chicago in October 1871, when a fire in a small barn erupted into a hurricane of flame. The firestorm left 300 dead, 100,000 homeless. 18,000 buildings reduced to rubble. A half century of building gone up in smoke. Among the scorched ruins that just two weeks before had been the city of Chicago, roamed a 25-year veteran of the Boston Fire Department, Fire Chief John S. Damrell. He had dedicated his entire adult life to firefighting, intensely studying every major fire in America. Most fire chiefs have a feeling that they're going to face the fire of a lifetime. It's never a question in their mind of, is it going to happen? The question is, when is it going to happen? What Chief Damrell learned was beyond his imagination. The city had burned with a ferocity never before seen. More troubling, Damrell knew that a firestorm like Chicago's could happen in any city, even Boston. This man walking among the ashes was looking at the scene differently than others might have. He was looking at the path of the fire he was looking at what was left of the buildings. In many cases, there were buildings in Chicago that people thought were fireproof, and they laid at ashes at his feet. But Danrell also saw among the ruins, for the first time, a way to stop these devastating firestorms. Damrell came back to Boston more determined than ever to protect his beloved city. He alerted the city council to the threat of a firestorm. 
The fire in the city of Chicago is without a parallel in the history of the world. Their experience has proved that however well protected a city may be from ordinary fires, large conflagrations are possible. Chief Dan Rall was a strategic thinker, not only in combating fire, but in attempting to make sure it never happened in the first place. He could see that it was the built infrastructure, that it was the codes and standards, it was the enforcement arm, it was the insurance, the architects played a role. And so here was a man who could see the vivid lessons of Chicago and know that if change wasn't made, they would simply repeat them in Boston. The city's leaders did not really comprehend Damrell's warning, believing that Chicago, while tragic, was a western wooden city. No comparison to the brick and granite city being built in Boston. There's a great deal of thinking among the leaders of Boston society at that period of time that Boston should be a world-class city. Boston has turned a point where it is no longer a colonial port. It is no longer a simple federal metropolis. And Boston is going to be up there with London and Paris and Rome and Vienna. Boston was in the process of reinventing itself from this commercial maritime port into a financial center with the wealth that had come out of the commerce of the China traders and the merchant traders who had made fortunes, now had these tremendous fortunes to invest in other things. This was the era of the Boston Brahmin. Boston Brahmins being the uh, very wealthy, an elite a class unto itself that ran the city. They considered themselves the hub of the solar system, as Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, and they described Boston as the Athens of America. This socially conscious elite created the first public school system and provided care for the needy. They also embarked on massive commercial developments that transformed the face of the city, including its vital urban center, Summer Street and that section of the city had been a major area of growth. This was a premier residential neighborhood that then rapidly began to morph into a commercial district instead. By the 1870s, Trinity Church, the last remnant of the old neighborhood, was surrounded by warehouses, factories, and stores. But where Boston's leaders saw beautiful large buildings downtown, Boston's fire chief, John S. Damrell, saw the potential fire hazards, what the city center lacked, what dangers lay beneath. The streets were too narrow. The mansard roofs were fire chief Damrell's nightmare. He knew that, unlike European cities, Boston's mansard roofs were finished in wood and were stuffed to their wooden rafters with flammable textiles, paper stock, and oils. The old pipes adequate for residential neighborhoods could not supply enough water to protect the new warehouses. Sometimes the streams from the old pipes could not even reach the tops of the tall buildings downtown. Every year, Damrell would ask the city to fireproof the mansard roofs, enlarge the water pipes, and add new hydrants. But he was always met with resistance from the politicians running City Hall. I sent a written communication to the president of the water board. He did not answer me in writing, but sent one of his clerks who said, when they wanted any suggestions from the fire chief, they would let me know. The head of the water board, Nathaniel Bradley, had become Damrell's nemesis. If the streets were to be piped the size necessary for a conflagration, it would cost millions of dollars. The city wouldn't be justified in making such an expenditure. Nathaniel Bradley was not only a well-known architect, he was successful, he was wealthy, and his family and he were connected to many Boston families. Damrell was probably someone who was perceived as an upstart, 
And I think in some ways the two of them must have had some very heated discussions. One was an engineer and architect. The other had actually gotten his hands dirty as a fireman and as a master builder. And like Bradley, many at City Hall believe they had already made vital investments in the fire department, including 21 modern steam engines and the nation's first telegraph alarm system. By 1871, Boston's state-of-the-art system had expanded to over 100 alarm boxes wired to the central station in City Hall. These boxes were locked because there was still a great fear of false alarms being sent in. At every box was posted where a key was kept, and policemen also had keys to the box. Damro knew the locked alarm was a weak link. But he made sure his men were trained for a quick and organized response to every alarm. In the months following the Chicago fire, his firemen extinguished nearly 500 fires with comparatively small losses. Damro was proud of his men, his brothers in firefighting. After all, he was one of them. Born of humble origins in Boston's North End, Damrell had grown up hearing stories of his father and uncle's adventures as volunteer firefighters. But it was the death of both his parents by the time he was 12 that led him to form the bond that would change his life. What pulled him into that volunteer firefighting career was that he wanted the sense of family. He'd lost his family, and the firefighters become a brotherhood. He wanted to feel that kind of connectedness. Damrell's painful childhood in the dense and disease-ridden urban landscape of the mid-1800s gave him a sense of purpose. He would fight to make cities safer and prevent the unnecessary loss of life brought about by another plague of the times, fire. After apprenticing with a carpenter to learn the building trade, he joined the volunteer firefighters at age 18. The old volunteers it was as social as much as it was uh, a firefighting organization. Back in those days, being a member of a fire company was a huge part of one's life. The volunteer fire departments in those days sort of answered to nobody but themselves. There was a tremendous amount of competition that would occur between the volunteers. There was a concept called getting first water. And whoever got first water on a fire it was like something to brag about. More often than not, the volunteers would spend as much time fighting each other as they did fighting the fire. As fire departments replaced the old hand pumpers with state-of-the-art steam engines, relying on untrained volunteers became a lot more dangerous. Steamers would blow up. And people didn't have the right valves in the right positions and weren't paying attention to what they're doing. They'd explode. The foreman of cataract engine number four had already distinguished himself for his technical savvy and skill in directing his men. When Boston's fire department sought out someone to train the new steam engine companies, John Damrell was promoted to captain. During this time, John starts a business of his own in construction. And as he's building that business, he's also, of course, working in the volunteer fire department. He is seeing what makes a building burn. He understands that there's a cause and effect. You build a better building, they don't burn as quickly. In 1866, at age 37, Damrell was elected Boston's fire chief. Firefighters all over Boston celebrated Damrell's promotion. One engine company even named their new steamer after him. Engine number 11, the John S. Damrell. He worked his way up through the fire department. He was a master builder. 
He was politically active. He had been an alderman. So I think Dan Rowe was really well qualified to be the chief engineer of the department. He was not just a fire chief, but he was a great leader among his troops, among the firefighters in the city of Boston that reported to him. They respected him. They looked up to him. They understood that he was their voice. This is a turning point. It's a turning point for John Damrell, and it's a turning point for Boston. He's looking at the water supply. Is it adequate? Are there fire engines stationed in critical places throughout the city? As chief, Damrell finally saw his chance to carry out his vision for a safer city. But he was thrown into the cauldron of Boston politics, a Byzantine system designed so that no one person would have too much power. The water department was separate from the fire department. The electric telegraph for an alarm system, that too was under a different committee. The building department was under a different agency. The fire department had very little control. But Damrell was no stranger to the back halls and closed doors of City Hall. He quietly worked the system to strengthen the city's fire defenses. He launched a campaign to restrict the construction of shoddy fire-prone buildings. By 1871, he successfully lobbied the state legislature to pass codes so that all new buildings would be built to higher standards. Then, in October of that same year, the devastating Chicago fire reminded Damrell that he was running out of time. And Chicago had been no ordinary fire. It was a firestorm. A firestorm is just this all-consuming ball of fire that sweeps across the landscape and devastates everything in its path. It becomes so overpowering that it creates a wind, and some people have referred to it as a hurricane wind. Chicago taught Damrell that fighting these firestorms with old-fashioned methods was a mistake. It was not uncommon in those days for people to think that the best way to put out a fire was to set off explosives and blow buildings up in the path. Well, most of the people found out that by blowing the buildings up, they just created a big pile of kindling and the fire kept right on going. As Damrell reported from his interview with the famous Civil War General Philip Sheridan, the glowing accounts in the newspapers of success using gunpowder were erroneous in every particular. It was a failure. Buildings blown up burned quicker because they were blown. I got that from General Sheridan himself. Damro learned how the fire in Chicago got out of hand. The alarm delayed. Fire engines misdirected. Bad water distribution. Tall buildings with flammable mansard roofs too high for streams to reach. All of the same hazards plaguing Boston. But Damrell's concerns were not shared by city officials, confident that Boston had the best trained and equipped fire department in the country. And in the summer of 1872, City Hall welcomed the World Peace Jubilee, celebrating the end of war in Europe. Inside the massive auditorium, 100 firemen with hammers joined the 2000 Peace Orchestra in banging out the Anvil Chorus. <laughs> As Boston's high spirits stretched from summer to early fall, the Boston Red Stockings won the National Association Baseball League. 
Boston was on top of the world. But a few weeks later, Boston's euphoria was dampened. A debilitating illness afflicted every horse in the city, including Damro's highly trained teams. This is an epidemic that started in the area of Toronto, spread to the East Coast, ran westward across the United States, and south as far as Panama. Every place, the symptoms were the same. Running nose, coughing, high fever. Animals that were worked would often drop dead. All the horses in the city were sick, and so were not being used to pull any kind of equipment. And so the firefighters were pulling their own equipment. But it meant that they couldn't get to fires quite as quickly. A mild breeze gossiped through Boston's deserted downtown streets. The last businesses had closed at six o'clock. Only the music and laughter from the theaters and noisy boys looking for mischief breached the Saturday night serenity of downtown Boston. At seven o'clock, in a basement under a factory showroom on Summer Street, a spark vaulted into flammable packing material. Soon, the fire disturbed the Saturday evening peace of the Pratt family nearby. What first attracted our attention was the cracking glass. Within a few minutes, the fire broke through the elevator wall. The minute it went into the elevator, it roared up as though gunpowder had been laid there. Down in the street, fire! Pratt and others shouted for an alarm to be rung. It took 15 minutes for a policeman to hear the shouts, run to an alarm box, unlock it, and pull the alarm, a delay that would cost Damrell dearly. As soon as he heard the fire alarm bells ringing 5-2, Damrell knew the fire was in the dreaded downtown district with weak water supplies and tall buildings. He grabbed his fire helmet and his coat and ran to the fire ground. He knew that fire was there by what he could see in the sky. But the minute you come around that corner and you go face to face with what you see that you have on the ground right then, all of your knowledge and training are brought into a very sharp focus because you've only got a couple of minutes to start making your mind up. Within eight minutes from the time the alarm sounded, I was on the ground and I never saw such a sight. The building was one vast furnace. With horses still sick, Damrell had organized teams of men to roll in the heavy steam engines. But they were arriving too few, too late. I told them, for God's sake, hold this corner. And they said they would if I would give them water. I would have been most happy to do it, but I had not the water to give. The water supply was already giving out. Suddenly, flaming whirlwinds arched over the streets. In seconds, all corners ignited. It was tremendous heat. He was being showered with huge embers falling on him, raining down on the other buildings. This fire was creating its own wind. He was seeing all the conditions he had warned against, uh, uh, those dreaded conditions he had feared. It was all coming to play right before his eyes. Ever since Chicago, Damrell had fought this fire a hundred times in his mind. He then did something no fire chief had ever done before. Just 30 minutes after the first alarm, he gave the order to telegraph every town within 50 miles to send men and engines. 
there are at least two windows that all good fire ground commanders have got in the back of their mind. One of them is the sense of the immediate. Like, what do I need to do right now to do everything I can to keep this fire exactly where it is? The second thing that they have to keep into consideration is what am I going to do if my current actions fail me? What's my fallback position? Damrell deployed his engines to surround the fire and ordered a tugboat supplied with pumps to cover the wharves and bridges. But beneath Boston's granite facades, the flames were quickly devouring the wood frame interiors. Within a short period of time, it seemed as if hell had broken loose and buildings began to actually implode. Many of these new buildings were actually burning at a rate of almost a block an hour. And the fire was spreading rapidly through the highly flammable mansard roofs overhead. There had been concern about these roofs. And indeed, much of the fire spread from roof to roof, which makes it very hard to fight because you have to shoot, try to get the water up so high. And when you don't have pressure, and many of the firefighters found there was very little pressure, they really couldn't reach the flames. To stop the fires along the mansard roofs, Damrell directed a hundred policemen to shield block-long roof lines with wet carpets and blankets. It was a technique he learned 20 years earlier as a volunteer, but it had never before been used like this on a massive scale to fight a conflagration. But the firestorm had already destroyed several blocks. Damrell raced against a disaster that began to look more like Chicago every minute. A firestorm is an overwhelming event. You're surrounded by fire. It's chaos. It's a maelstrom. There's nowhere to run. There's nowhere to hide. It's flying over your head. It's potentially outracing you. Uh, it's out of control. Damrell sent scouts out to determine the extent of the fire. Then he rushed toward the tenement houses where many families were refusing to leave even as the fire was closing in. Suddenly, a small hand grabbed his. I met a little lad who came up and asked me to get his father and mother. I endeavored to do so and asked him to point out where they were. The young boys panicked. His parents are inside one of the burning buildings. Damrell immediately goes into the building and goes up to the second story. He can't go any further. He's forced back down the stairs by the building inferno. I got into one story of the building and could not get to the other. And he has to tell the boy that he was not able to find his parents. It was too late. He had physical courage. I mean, this guy was a firefighter. He wasn't standing around watching things happen. He actually did it. Damrell climbed to the roof of a tall building. What he saw there was daunting. The firestorm burned uncontrolled in all directions. But he saw a chance to stop it in Winthrop Square and raced back to the fire ground. The crowds that were flocking to the streets during the fire were basically getting in the way of the firefighters who were trying to get their equipment into position. Captain Smith recalled, I had great difficulty in keeping the people away so that we could get our engine attached to the hydrant. I never had so much trouble or came so near to getting into a fight. Many of the people who own stores in the area were trying to get their goods out of the stores get their books, their safes with money. It was just a scene of total disarray where thieves could fly their trade. Damrell pushed his way through the crowd to Winthrop Square. With over a dozen engines concentrated in the wide plaza, 
he came close to holding back the wall of flame. But once again, not enough water. The water gave out and we could not hold it. Whether we could have accomplished it, I cannot say positively, but I will say this. It was terribly disheartening. What I think was probably going through his mind at that point in time was that he was looking for the right set of conditions that would allow him to set up a line of defense that would not fail him again. The firestorm spread across the square, and Damrell was forced to pull his engine teams back. Damrell came up with a new plan. He would no longer fight the fire block by block. Instead, he'd try to contain it using the harbor and the major arteries around the city center, where pipes were larger and the water supply more abundant. He looked at the big picture. He tried to cut his losses, knowing that certain buildings were gone. He determined where he could attempt to make his breaks on the fire. Techniques we'd still use today. Not everyone was happy with Damrell's plan. The other handicap that Damrell faced were many citizens offering him their opinions on how the fire should be fought. Uh, today, I would have those people arrested and hauled away. He had the president of Harvard. He had Reverend Philip Brooks. All kinds of distinguished citizens concerned about their own properties. And they were telling Damrell how to fight the fire. At City Hall, those who had once thought Boston untouchable were seeing their pride go up in flames. In the midst of the worst fire they had ever witnessed, they demanded that Damrell come immediately. The mayor's office was full of desperate city officials and frantic Brahmins. Damrell scanned the group. He knew he could not rely on anyone there to back him up, especially not General Burt, the postmaster. We have all the United States government property in our custody, as well as that of the city and citizens. Certainly we must do something. It will be disgraceful to have this city burned down, as it has been burning for the past four hours. Bert was very insistent that gunpowder should be used to blow up key buildings in the city to create a firebreak to prevent the spread of the fire. Damrell, based on his experience, talking with the chief in Chicago, knew it was of limited value and probably not worth doing. If you're being resisted, People are doing their very darndest to convince you to do something even if you think it's wrong. Sometimes you do it to get it over with so you can move on and do what you really want to do. Danro bent to the opinion in the room. He authorized Bert and others to use gunpowder and they went out with police escorts to organize the gunpowder teams. As Damrell left City Hall, he received reports that his new plan was working. Having reached an area with larger pipes, the fire had been contained in the south. To the east, Damrell's tugboat had successfully defended Boston's waterfront. Encouraged, Damrell turned west, where the fire blazed into the line anchored by Old South Church. Old South, Damrell knew, was crucial. If the fire stopped there, it would save City Hall, and the State House, and Beacon Hill. And as important, all of Boston felt that Old South must be saved. For Boston, this was an incredible symbol of our revolutionary heritage. This is where the uh, Boston Tea Party was planned. Out of desperation, with the firestorm closing in on Old South, Damrell decided to try gunpowder to create a firebreak. Together with one of his captains, he planted barrels of gunpowder in a three-story building across from Old South. I put in 10 kegs under the stairs. 
The cinders were flying like the flakes in a driving snowstorm. I put fuses into the bungholes of the kegs and said to my comrade, if we go up, we will go together, but we will make a clean thing of this. The explosion only blew out windows and doors, leaving the building standing, filled with rubble that fed the flames. Damrell now saw firsthand that gunpowder was virtually useless to form a firebreak. In the less experienced hands of the powder teams, gunpowder was wreaking havoc all over the city. You have to imagine individuals with no experience in gunpowder, carrying gunpowder into these buildings. Gas mains were exploding. They had debris falling all over the place, basically doing more damage. These men, they seemed to be pretty eager to get in there with their kegs of powder. He was afraid they were gonna kill themselves and only extend the fire even further. With horrific reports from all over the fire ground, Damrell realized the explosions must end. He gave orders to intercept the powder teams and put them under police arrest if necessary. Back at Old South Church, Damrell's firefighters and volunteers were feeling the effects of the all-night battle. The survival of Old South hung by a thread the men got on top of the buildings and put on carpets and wet cloths. And we played up with our streams and wet them down for perhaps 300 feet each way. And Damrell's other strategy, telegraphing for reinforcements at the instant the firestorm began, was also paying off. At the last possible moment in the Battle of the Old South Church, arrived firefighters from other parts of New England. They came from Maine, they came from New Hampshire, Connecticut, and many of these firefighters were pouring in from around the state seeking to relieve the Boston firefighters who were now very exhausted. With the fire held at Old South, over 50 engines from Providence to Portsmouth finally overwhelmed the fire demon. After 12 hours of tireless battle, the firestorm had been defeated. One of the important things to understand is this wasn't just a contained fire, it was a full-fledged firestorm. Up to this point in American history, no one had successfully fought a firestorm and won. Damrell was the first to do this. The city breathed a heady mixture of relief and sorrow. Although Boston had suffered great loss, its fire chief had saved it from total destruction. By keeping the firestorm from reaching the city's residential neighborhoods, Damrell had held down the human toll. 20 dead compared to Chicago's 300. Still, nine of Damrell's men had fallen. Bedridden with singed lungs, he mourned their loss in heartfelt letters to their families. In this sad and trying hour, may we not catch one gleam of comfort and solace from the fact that his death was no ordinary one? He is to the world the noblest of the world's noble heroes. For no greater can the world present than he who lays down his life for another.
Damrell's vision had saved Boston from Chicago's fate, but his legacy would risk falling victim to the forces that had challenged him every step of the way. The news of Boston's firestorm, just one year after Chicago's, shocked the nation. If fire could destroy a city of brick and granite, was any city safe? As Damrell's men finally quenched the piles of stubborn coals, Boston organized its relief to the homeless and jobless, then began to clear the rubble from the streets. It wasn't just the fact that buildings had burnt. It seemed as if everything had been obliterated. Fingers of masonry simply pointed to the sky. Ministers began to preach on Sundays about God's retribution of Boston and the rampant growth and development. Many people in Boston began to look at the fire as something that had destroyed fortunes. Fueled by complaints from burnt out building owners and businessmen, Boston's political cauldrons started to boil. The mayor was pressured into calling commission. A commission was set up to hear evidence about the progress in the management of the fire. The commission called over 200 witnesses but there was no question whose job was on the line. They grilled Damrell three times in day-long sessions, asking him point blank, how did this disaster happen? And Chief Damrell said, look at the record, gentlemen, at which point he brings out the five years of annual reports where he has told them about the water supply. He has urged them to make the changes in the hydrants. He wanted to make all these improvements and his warnings had been ignored. To rebuff the fire chief's testimony, the commission called other experts, starting with Damrell's nemesis, Nathaniel Bradley, the head of the water board. I don't see that the hydrants requested are any advantage over our present hydrants, although the firemen claim that they are. I think everything depends in case of fire on its management at its starting point. One of the issues was whether John Darmel was too busy on the front scenes and didn't stay back and direct from afar. Did he give up his responsibility as a kind of a general, as a kind of a leader of the situation? But every firefighter testifying before the commission endorsed Damrell's strategy, which saved residential areas. A fire is a very dynamic situation, very fluid, it's moving. Damrell couldn't be waiting to get reports coming in. He had to see what was happening, he had to give orders, he had to be able to communicate. Those are luxuries we have today he did not have. When a fire ground commander ends up with his back against property that did not burn, if the fire was stopped and there was business and private residences that ended up surviving, then somebody fought that fire. The mood of the hearing shifted to Damrell's advantage. Even General Burt, the postmaster and leader of the gunpowder teams, came to his defense. Mr. Damrell came to the post office and I showed him the tremendous danger which threatened us and he helped us in our building for the next hour. He certainly did his duty there. Damrell himself had only one regret. I have gone over the ground in my mind again and again, and I say candidly that I know of no place where I would change my tactics in any way, shape, or manner with the exception of the use of gunpowder. After two months of hearings, the commission issued its findings. They criticized Damrell's frontline management and the many personal risks he took. 
but they recommended everything the fire chief had tirelessly fought for. More central firehouses, larger pipes, better hydrants, bigger engines, and new building codes. And they concluded that gunpowder should never be used as it was that night. With the news of his victory, Damrell's popularity soared. The residents of Boston credited Damrell with saving their lives and homes. Songs were dedicated to him. But not everybody in Boston was singing Damrell's praises. Many property owners resented that Damrell had chosen to save some buildings, but not theirs. Some were even suing him over their buildings being blown up. They pressured City Hall for Damrell's removal as the city began to rise from its ashes. Boston rebuilds quickly in great measure because Boston had the capital to do that the financial resources and the need to rebuild the city existed here and allowed it to proceed rapidly in its reconstruction. Building owners and merchants were desperate to get back into business. But as the city was rebuilding, only six months after the firestorm, Boston suffered another fire. Although much smaller than its predecessor, this fire convinced Damrell that the city had to accelerate radical reforms. But the fire convinced his enemies that the city needed a new fire chief. Later that month, unaware of any political maneuvering in Boston, Damrell traveled to New York to witness a demonstration of a new aerial ladder from Italy. Meeting with fire chiefs from all over the country, Damrell emphasized the key lesson of Boston's fire, that it would take more than engines and ladders to stop America's cities from burning down. He comes up with a dramatic proposal, bringing together fire chiefs from all over the country for the purposes of sharing information new technologies, fire prevention and firefighting strategies. Chief Damrell suggested the concept of a larger organization on a bigger scale, the National Association of Fire Engineers. The fire chiefs elected Damrell unanimously to be the president of America's first national firefighting organization. Flush with his success with the fire chiefs, Damrell returned to Boston, only to be greeted with shocking news. His political foes had restructured the entire fire department. By creating a board of fire commissioners, they had stripped him of the power to choose his own captains. The politicians sold it as a reform, but to Damrell, it was clearly a demotion. He felt he had no choice but to resign. After almost 30 years, John Damrell was no longer a Boston firefighter. When John resigned from the fire department, he could have gone into politics he could have devoted his time to his own business, but he didn't. He sought a way to get back into firefighting. Trusting his shrewd sense of Boston politics, Damrell waited for the winds to shift. As he looked at his beloved city, he could see that the new buildings were as fire-prone as the ones they had replaced. 
For decades, cities across America had endured what Damrell called the build-as-you-please style of combustible architecture. He felt that the only way he could prevent future fires was to start before construction with the building codes. Two years after leaving the fire department, he lobbied for the creation of a building commission and was appointed chief inspector. The new department had the power to shut down projects if they violated fire codes. Over the next few years, Damrell transformed Boston's building practices so that a firestorm like the one in 1872 would never happen again. His department led the nation with codes mandating fire escapes, fire exits, and fire-resistant construction. He was particularly concerned about making sure people could get out. He went to the press and said, we must build these buildings safer, these tenements. We can't have these stairwells in the center of these buildings that just act like a flu, like a chimney, and just draw the fire up through the stories. His passion for carrying forward these safety improvements can only be described as absolutely tenacious. He never let go. He pushed, pushed, pushed. Twenty years later, Damrell led a parade of visiting firemen from Philadelphia. He had become the driving force transforming the landscape of fire safety across the nation. As American urban centers expanded upward and outward, Damrell crusaded for a dynamic national code, one that could keep pace with new building technologies. Have these terrible lessons not sunk deep enough to awaken attention to the perils of ill-constructed cities? Or shall we still risk the melting away in smoke of millions upon millions more of accumulated wealth? His vision was a fire-safe city. His passion was the saving of lives and property, and he felt that there were two ways through that. One is to have strong fire defenses. Secondly, is to have a strong code. Soon, Damrell built a coalition that included all the people instrumental to a national code. Not only fire chiefs, but legislators, architects, builders, and insurance underwriters. In 1905, the national code was adopted. But Damrell did not live to see the progress from that historic event. He died later that year at the age of 77. It would take another decade for the new, safer buildings to proliferate throughout the country. The urban conflagration that devastated most of the cities in the 1870s and 1880s pretty much went out of existence by 1920. And the fire chiefs had a big influence on that. For 40 years, as a firefighter, building inspector, code writer, and coalition builder, John Damrell had fought for his vision of a fire-safe city. He did not himself claim credit, not for the lives he saved, nor the firestorms he stopped. It was his duty as he saw it. But it earned him a place among other unsung firefighters. A place among the noblest of the world's noble heroes who dedicate their lives to battle deadly and destructive fires and allow America and its cities to grow and prosper. There are people who've walked in his footsteps. One thing we in the fire service enjoy is we have a chance to stand on the shoulders of giants. And he was one of the giants. <laughs>